In the 16th century, Istanbul was the capital of the greatest Islamic empire the world has ever known. Ruled by Suleiman the Magnificent, it stretched from Baghdad to Budapest. The center of power was Topkapi Palace, and in the heart of Topkapi was the harem. Into it came hundreds of women from all over the empire and beyond, the personal slaves of the Sultan. But in the imperial palace, sex could equal power. This is the story of those women and of the closed and secret world of the Ottoman harem. In 1520, a newcomer entered the Imperial Palace in Istanbul. Her name was Alexandra Lizovska. She was the daughter of a priest from the Ukraine, captured by slave hunters to join the army of servants and concubines in the service of the Sultan. They were slaves not of Turkish extraction. Either Slavs captured by the Tatars, probably, or from the Caucasus, who were very prized for their looks. White skin, dark hair, and delicate bone structure. And they were predominantly Christian. The enslavement of freeborn Muslims was forbidden by the Quran. In our history, writing about the harem and the sultan's women, or talking about them, is a sin and is forbidden. So nobody has written anything, and we always have to decorate these stories in our imagination. And foreign travelers have also done this. People went to the Ottoman Empire in the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries and they were very taken with the idea that there were all these uh, women locked up together. They soon came up with stories that filled in the gaps of their ignorance about what was going on in the harem. Most of those involved a lot of sex, a lot of rather abusive treatment of young women. The first Englishman to catch a glimpse into the imperial harem was a London mechanic sent by Queen Elizabeth I to the palace of the great sultan to install her gift of an organ. Through the grate I did see 30 of the grand signor's concubines that were playing with a ball. At first sight I thought they had been young men, but when I saw the hair of their heads hanging down on their backs, I did know them to be women, and very pretty ones indeed. Bing. They wore breeches so thin I could discern the skin of their thighs through it. I stood so long looking upon them that he who had showed me began to be very angry and stamped with his staff to make me give over looking. The inner part of the palace, especially the harem, was officially called the abode of felicity because the sultan had a special relationship with God this was the reason why all the means of happiness were actually supplied. The best food, the best things to drink, the best music, the best singing, the best manuscripts with figures in them, which is frowned upon by strict Muslims. So you have the means to be happy, but it's very difficult to tell whether they actually were happy. A descendant of Suleiman's one of the last princes to have lived in the harem, considered that his ancestors would have found it more lonely than lavish. The prince lived a luxurious life, 
was a very lonely life in a way because all he had were hundreds of women around him. I lived amongst them and I was more or less brought up by them. I didn't realize it at the time that it was anything extraordinary because I was used to it. You think everybody else lives that way. But to the priest's daughter, soon to be known as Hurem, it would have been anything but ordinary. When the girls first arrived, they would be examined to make sure that they didn't have any physical defects, have any diseases. Women come to the harem at an early age. And as soon as they arrive, their clothes are changed and they're taken directly to the hammam, the bathhouse. They are cleaned according to our traditions and taught how to wash before prayers. The type that Turkish men like is what we call balaketli, flesh firm like a fish. And another detail, they say, Iva Gabayi, meaning the belly should be shaped like a quince. In our literature too, when we describe women, we say cheeks like peaches, lips like cherries, similes like these, and that's what men expect. The Islamic religious law permits polygamy. A man could marry up to four women at any given time and could also have concubines on the side. But as the numbers of polygamous marriages were really very few. Only the ruling class, for example, like your sultans, would have a harem. When he was a young ruler, it was said by foreign diplomats that Suleiman, very lustful, frequently visited the palace of the women and there, in their phrase, did justice, i.e. made love. And indeed, the sultan was encouraged to behave a bit as a prize stud to cover more and more mass so that the biological future of the dynasty was secured. I think the reason that the Ottomans chose to reproduce through concubines is it gave them more reproductive freedom. Um, the difference between having a child with a concubine and having a child with, say, a royal princess is that the princess, the married woman, has many more rights um, as a mother. Concubines, because they are slaves, have fewer rights over children. The sultan was considered to be above society, separate from it. That was the very ideology of the state. You can imagine that a relationship by marriage to a free Muslim woman, the daughter of some important writer in Istanbul or some, would immediately make the sultan related to a segment of society, and this may cause divisions with other segments, etc. These are the personal slaves of the sultans. They don't have any family. They don't have any connections. We don't know the feelings of the women who entered the harem. There must have been fear and terror as well as other emotions, but also the delight of material comforts. And there was a possibility of becoming the Sultan's consort. The imperial harem in 16th century Istanbul was one of the most secret societies in the world. 
Even in the early 20th century, shortly before it was abolished, it was difficult to discover precisely what went on here. I asked my mother and my mother's sisters about their grandmother's life in the harem, and they said that uh, because it was prohibited to talk about the life in the harem, she could tell nothing to them. Modern historians have been less restricted and their discoveries have challenged the old Western fantasies. It's not where women lounged around and spent their time, the sort of Orientalist image we have. We should think of the harem as a unique place, as a collection of females who were more highly educated, more highly trained, and trained in a variety of ways than women in this general society. So I think we might think of the imperial harem as the only female university in the empire. The latest undergraduate was the priest's daughter, Alexandra Lizovska, now known as Hurem, the laughing one. When a woman like Hurem arrived in the harem, she would be given further education. Uh, and by education, I mean some religious training, a knowledge of Islam. She would be taught the etiquette of the court. She would be trained in the skill that most harem women were adept at, that is, embroidery. Wonderful things. The embroidery that she produced could be sold through agents on the market. So it, it was a profitable skill. It wasn't just a, a gentlewomanly skill. They learned the palace attitude. That was not very easy. How to greet people and to walk backwards to leave the Sultan's room. And how to be respectful and well behaved at all times and never be angry. They had lessons every day and most learned to read and write and to read the Quran. Had the prying eyes of Western travelers pierced the outer walls, they would have perceived a vastly different harem from the sexual paradise or inferno of their imagining. Making love is the one thing most inmates of the harem were not doing, at least if they were following the rules. Relatively few got to spend a night with the Sultan. Living there must have been very claustrophobic. If you've got a relatively small space with several hundred women living in it, access to the outside world is very limited. The views over Istanbul, if you could get them, must have been um, quite, had quite an effect on people. It was a very comfortable place, but it was more like a comfy prison than a comfy bordello. and the prison warders were the eunuchs. Only men who had been castrated were allowed into the harem on a regular basis. And like the women, most would spend their entire lives here. The enclosure of women itself seems very objectionable. Um, but perhaps even more objectionable is the mutilation of young men in order to provide uh, eunuchs to staff and protect the harem. It was forbidden by Islamic law to castrate a Muslim or perform the operation on others. So it was carried out by Coptic Christian priests in Egypt. The method of castration, and there are two types. One is cutting the testes and the other twisting and crushing them. Sometimes uh, there's a method called uh, clean shaven, and uh, which meant that they removed everything. And it made it almost impossible for them to perform their usual body functions. According to one ambassador, they kept uh, silver quills in their uh, turbans, and they would use those quills in order to urinate. One of the duties of the eunuchs was to ensure that the concubines did not have sex with anyone but the sultan, men, women, or whatever else came to hand. 
cucumbers were not let into the harem because they were used uh, as a penis, it is said. <laughs> but the guards themselves were not beyond suspicion. The process of castration was very frightening and difficult for the boys, and often, out of fear, their uh, testicles would retreat. They would remain intact, and sometimes over time, they would be able to function sexually. There are many accounts of the eunuchs having relationships with the women in the harem. This was one reason why the eunuchs in the harem were exclusively African. It was one way of making sure that these men couldn't inseminate the female members of the imperial family without everybody noting that she'd given birth to a uh, half-black child. But for Hurem, as for most newcomers to the harem, there was little opportunity for dalliance with eunuchs or anyone. If the girls were higher in the power structure of the harem, they would be given their own quarters. But the rest of the girls would uh, share their rooms. There were older women who watched over the younger girls to make sure that they weren't getting into any kind of a mischief, such as talking in the dark, sharing their bed together. Girls' boarding school or comfy prison, it was not perhaps the happiest of estates for the daughter of a priest. But if Huren dreamed of improving her lot, there was always the possibility of sex with the Sultan, though this too was hedged with its own barriers of ritual and restraint. There's some report that, you know, Sultans like to watch lots of pretty girls sort of jumping about in the altogether. Um, there's the story that the Sultan would throw a handkerchief towards the woman who caught his eye. The surprised virgin snatches at this prize and good fortune with such eagerness that she is ravished with joy before she is deflowered by the sultan. Such reports have never been verified, and for most harem women not yet numbered among the favourites, a handkerchief was just another item of laundry. Very few of them ever got to see the Sultan, let alone jump into his bed. I mean, in order to get anywhere and not just be washing the Sultan's underpants the rest of your life, you had to manoeuvre yourself into position with the women who chose who went to bed with the Sultan, his mother. In reality, the Sultan's mother would scout for suitable candidates among these now derelict pools and fountains in the bowels of Topkapi. And physical attraction was far from being her only criteria. An eligible concubine would obviously need to be attractive. She needed to be healthy because her principal job was reproduction. Because of the important role that mothers played in training their sons, she also needed to be shrewd. And the way they were introduced was that they were <clears throat> asked to go to a semi-covered pool underneath the Crown Princess apartment. And that was an opportunity for the sultans to watch them and observe them and choose their favorites. Whatever it was that brought Hurem to the attention of the sultan, or indeed his mother, the preparations for her first night with him would have followed a well-established ritual. The day she is going to be with the Sultan, she goes to the bathhouse and has face and body treatments. And her hands and hair are painted with henna. 
The idea of any hair on the body was a thought of horror, and so they would remove any kind of hair, including their pubic hair. What they used was really an awful smelling paste that contained arsenic. And if you left it too long, it could burn the skin very badly. And they used muscle shells to scrape it off. They would put henna, four fingers, above the pubic area as a decorative, beautiful design detail. Concubines were assumed to be virgins. But I don't think we can assume the naivete and the innocence. It's that kind of goes along with the whole notion of virgins. I mean, these women were prepared for their job. I don't know the details. We have stories written by European observers. Are they fanciful? Are they true? It's hard to know. All the older women, and those who have had his good graces before, go to the favorite of the day, congratulating her for the great distinction which she has received, and saluting her as befits the concubine of the emperor, dressing her superbly, and decking her out with countless jewels. She would be given new clothes and shoes and, and trained also in the erotic arts. We don't really know exactly what that entailed. I think we have to assume, however, that the Sultan's mother, his sisters, experienced women, high-level women within the harem, would probably provide the finishing touches, would explain the particular person that the concubine would encounter. My son is like this. Your lord is like this. The court musician, Albert Bobovy, provided a colorful account of the courtship ritual. While music is played, the women sing before her and conduct her to the door of the chamber where there is a eunuch who tells the sultan of her arrival and has her enter when the sultan commands it. As soon as she sees him, she must go to him running and kneel at his feet, and he receives her and holds what conversation seems good to him with the women's music continuing to play at the door while she is with him. There are also stories of her entering the bed from the foot of the bed. So the sultan would be waiting for this beauty to crawl from the foot of the bed and reach him. Whatever happened that night, Suleiman wanted it to continue. Hurem was invited back to his bed again and again. She was soon firmly established as the Sultan's favorite, to the exclusion, records tell us, of all others. The Venetian sources tell us that he fell in love with her. a deadly rivalry had reached into the harem. It was not simply a question of who would occupy the Sultan's bed. It was a far more vital conflict over who would produce the next ruler of the Ottoman Empire, the new favorite, Hurem, or the old favorite, Mahi Devran. Mahi Devran was the mother of the oldest son. So that Hurem coming in, obviously being the Sultan's new favorite, was a threat to her. According to Venetian report, Mahid Devran picked a fight with Hurem and called her soiled meat. A piece of meat off the slave market. And this provoked uh, a physical struggle between them. Hurem's face was scratched, her hair was pulled. 
And the next time the Sultan called for Hurem, she replied she was unworthy of his attention since she was soiled meat. And of course this intrigues Suleiman, piques his curiosity and he calls her again. And she tells the whole story, of course, with Mahi Devran appearing as the bad guy. Here's an early sign of Hurem's intelligence and ability to manipulate the whole palace system. Hurem knew how to play her cards. You have to think how the women we know about got to where they got. We know about them because they fought their way tooth and claw up the ladder. It was incredibly intensely sort of concentrated ball of intrigue. Battling, jockeying for position, hoping to produce an heir. Hurem gave birth to her first son, Prince Mehmet, in 1521. If Suleiman had played the game by the rules, he should now have moved on to a new woman. But he didn't. Before Hurem's time, if a concubine of the Sultan produced a son, then she was kicked out of bed. Hurem produced one son, but then she produced several more. Suleiman kept her in his bed. There are a number of reasons why they followed this one mother, one son principle. Mothers were important advisors to their sons. So for us two sons to have to share a mother meant they only had half of an advisor, had half of support. If a woman is identified with only one son, she is completely with him in this game of power. And it was a game Hurem had to win. Under Islamic law, all sons had an equal right of inheritance. But in the Ottoman court, the losers lost more than the throne. The sons of a sultan were in combat. Survival of the fittest. The one who was strongest, most able, became the sultan. The sons were going to vie amongst themselves to become the sultan. And it was winner takes all. They had to race to Constantinople, they had to raise the support, and when they were acclaimed sultan, they put all their brothers to death. All dynasties have had problems in securing an uninterrupted and legitimate succession. Many wars have been started in England and France by discontented royal brothers or cousins or other relations. The Ottoman solution was to have a harem, see there was no lack of male heirs. After the Sultan's accession, other male members of the dynasty were murdered. If I had lived in those days, since I was a younger brother, I would probably have been strangled very young or even as a small child. But then after being strangled, I would have been buried with great ceremony, which is not much of a consolation. By 1530, Suleiman had five sons, and four of them were by Hurem. Hurem troubled people. They weren't used to a sultan keeping up a relationship with one woman, and they worried that Suleiman had, had, had gone head over heels in love. The foreign sources tell us that people even went so far as to call her a witch because of their fear that she had somehow seduced the sultan New concubines were brought into the harem in the hope of tempting Suleiman from the path of fidelity. They included two Russian women with the same highly prized looks as Hurem. Women given directly to the Sultan would be highly cultivated, attractive, intelligent women. Naturally, she might see a competition. Anyway, the story goes, she was so put out through a fit that the Sultan had to give them away. 
So here we see another sign of Hurem being able to manipulate the politics of the harem and, and to use her own special position as a real favorite of the Sultan. Other eligible concubines were married off as virgins to Suleiman's courtiers. And then, in 1534, 14 years after Suleiman and Hurem first made love, the Sultan made an even bigger break with tradition. Western observers were astounded. This week there occurred a most extraordinary event. Unprecedented in the history of the Sultans. Suleiman has taken to himself as his empress a slave woman from Russia. He married her, which is the incredible thing. Sultans didn't marry their concubines. They didn't, they didn't need to. A concubine, by definition, is a man's female slave. According to the religious law, you can't marry your own concubine. So you have to free her in order to marry her. There is great talk about the marriage, and none can say what it means. One thing it meant was power. For the first time in their history, the Ottomans had a queen. After she was married, we start calling her Hurem Sultan. And she was really like a queen. She builds up diplomatic relations, and she also influences her husband politically. In another move that impressed Western observers, Hurem occupied new apartments next to her husband. The chambers of the Sultana are very splendid, with chapels, baths, gardens, not only for herself, but her maids as well. But for long periods, the two lovers were apart. Suleiman was a fighting sultan who had already extended his empire westward. He took Belgrade. He destroyed the whole of the Hungarian ruling classes in 1526, the Battle of Mohash, at a stroke, and rode into Buda, a conqueror. And by 1529, he was at the gates of Vienna. But even on campaign, his thoughts were with Hurem. He sent frequent love letters and poems. Where we can get nearer to his personality is through his poems, which are remarkable for any ruler. The green of my garden, my sweet sugar, my treasure, my love who cares for nothing in this world. My master of Egypt, my Joseph, my everything, the queen of my heart's realm, my land of the Roman Caesars, my Baghdad and Khorasan. Lovely, lovely poems exist that pass back and forth in correspondence between the two. If the seas were to become ink and these trees pens, when could they write an account of this parting? There is no limit to the burning anguish of separation. Let my soul gain at least some comfort from a letter. Your son and daughter weep from missing you. But Hurem's letters also reveal her fears for the safety of her sons. The favoured heir to the throne was Prince Mustafa, the son of Hurem's old rival, Mahi Devran. Mustafa had the support of the army and the Grand Vizier, Ibrahim Pasha. Some viziers were captured slaves, like Ibrahim Pasha. He did become a companion and a favourite of the Sultan. They would generally dine together and he would, his bed was in the same room as the Sultan's. There are even stories of intense emotional relationship. 
Some Europeans spoke of a sexual relationship. Maybe yes, maybe no. In any event, that was a very close emotional and political relationship. So as a very young man, probably in his 20s, he was suddenly the top man in the empire after the Sultan himself. <laughs> Suleiman had cemented this relationship by giving his own sister in marriage to Ibrahim. None of this pleased the ambitious Hurem. Ibrahim's prestige was something she could not tolerate. We should not uh, forget that we are talking about uh, power politics here. 16th century Ottoman Empire was at its height. That meant tremendous power. So, of course, she wants to undermine it. In one of her letters, Hurem refers to a disagreement with Ibrahim Pasha. She writes to Suleiman, and now you inquire about why I'm not with Ibrahim Pasha. You'll hear about it when... You will hear about it when I am granted my next meeting with you. For the moment, give the Pasha our greetings. We hope they will be acceptable to him. Ibrahim played into her hands. Within very short space of time, he acquired lots of uh, wealth. Solomon the Magnificent could figure out where that wealth was coming from. At least partially, it was graft. If graft and corruption were among Ibrahim's faults, another was an arrogant assumption of his own worth. He is reported by one ambassador as saying, though I am the Sultan's slave, slave whatever, whatever I, say I say is done. done. I can at a stroke make a pasha out of a stable boy. I can give kingdoms and provinces to whosoever I choose, and my lord will say nothing against it. Ibrahim's confidence was misplaced. And on the 15th of March, 1536, Ibrahim Pasha accepted, as usual, the Sultan's invitation to dine with him. They eat at the same table until late at night, according to Ramadan traditions. They talk and entertain themselves, and then they go to bed. We don't really know what happened that night, but obviously, the Sultan had decided that the Grand Vizier had become too powerful. As a compliment to his boyhood friend, Suleiman apparently ordered the same method of execution reserved for his own kin, garroting with a bowstring so there would be no spilling of royal blood. But Ibrahim put up too much of a struggle. Suleiman, in both Ottoman sources and in European sources, is frequently portrayed as a man of ire. Anything that threatened the state or that threatened his own integrity as a ruler would motivate him to take violent moves. The next morning, Ibrahim's body was found outside the palace. This is a reminder of how Ottoman government worked. You could raise a peasant from the dust to be Grand Vizier, but his life hung by a thread. The next day, Ibrahim's wife, Solomon's sister, comes to the palace and blames the Sultan for her husband's death. Solomon goes to the harem to find shelter in Harem's arms. It's hard to see that Solomon himself would have done it without Harem egging him on. She wanted to be absolutely sure of her control, and until Ibrahim was out of the way, there was always a danger that she might be packed off herself. She was ruthless. She had to be ruthless. 
but the danger remained, and death was not under Hurem's exclusive control. In 1543, Hurem's ambitions received a fatal blow. Her young son, Prince Mehmet, was struck down by smallpox. His death began a new race for the succession, and the frontrunner was Mustafa, now in his thirties, the son of Hurem's old rival, Mahi Devran. This would mean death for Hurem's surviving sons. Suleiman's favorite son was Mustafa. He was also a favorite of the army. He was tall, he was strong, he was handsome. Uh, he, could, you know, he was gonna be a great ruler and everyone thought very highly of him. If Mustafa were to ascend the throne, the murder of her own children would be inevitable. It was impossible for Harem to accept this. The story is usually looked at as one of intrigue and competition among the mothers around their sons. I think there's a, a larger political context for this. Mustafa was very, very popular with the soldiers. He was a rival to his father without meaning to be, just by virtue of his popularity. And the Sultan was persuaded that Mustafa was conspiring against him. The story is that Hurem had an ally. It was the husband of her daughter, Mehima. Harem women could establish important alliances with male political actors through the marriages of their daughters. And this daughter's husband was the Grand Vizier. The new Grand Vizier was an important ally for Hurem and ideally placed to whisper slanders in the Sultan's ear. Word began to reach Suleiman while he was out on campaign that Mustafa was plotting against him. And Mustafa himself was very upset when news of these allegations reached him, and he went to see his father. Mustafa reached Suleiman's base in Iran and went straight to his tent. A Western diplomat reported what happened then. As soon as he entered the tent, several sturdy mutes made a determined attack upon him. They hurled Mustafa to the ground and, throwing a bowstring round his neck, strangled him. It was said that Suleiman urged the mutes to greater efforts, but Hurem was widely blamed for her role in the murder. I don't think Suleiman would have listened to these stories if he hadn't himself felt that there was a legitimate threat and that despite the fact that he was going to alienate so many people by executing his son, that this was probably the wiser move for the integrity of the empire. If tradition paints Hurem as the villain of the piece, it was at a time when powerful women were widely perceived as a threat to the established order. Hurem's contemporaries were Queen Elizabeth of England, Catherine de Medici of France, and Mary Queen of Scots, whom the Calvinist John Knox dubbed the Monstrous Regimen. Hurem aroused similar hostility among the Ottoman elite, though the extent of her power has been disputed. Hurem was obviously a very powerful woman. It's difficult for us to know how powerful because, of course, you know, as today in the corridors of power, things are decided in corridors and not written down. She was his eyes and ears, and of course, when the Sultan is away, it means she could probably do a few things on her own account as well. Hurem was a very smart and shrewd person, and she would write giving him news of what was going on, both within the family, but also political news. There's one letter she wrote when Suleiman was fighting the Iranians. She said, so everybody here in Istanbul is waiting to hear good news. 
They're ready to set up a parade, and we don't have any good news from you. Do you need a victory? Now, if a messenger arrives saying, no progress here, nothing there, no one is going to be very happy, my sultan. Harem was sensitive to public opinion, and she embarked on an ambitious building plan. One of the major expressions of power was building, building large mosques. That had in the prerogative of males in the dynasty. And Hurem is, in some ways, the first woman who builds quite publicly. But the public expression of Hurem's power was undermined by a fatal flaw. She had removed the main rival for the throne, but she had two sons, and they couldn't both rule. Under Ottoman law, one would have to die. Before the problem could be resolved, she became seriously ill. Suleiman, old now and also in bad health, kept vigil at her bedside. But even as he watched her fight for life, he must have known he would have to make a terrible choice over which of their sons would succeed him. It was probably Hurem's fortune that she did not live long enough to see the power struggle between her two sons. The younger son took arms against his older brother and the sultan. Suleiman had his youngest son executed as a traitor. But by then he had lost the love of his life. Hurem died on April the 18th, 1558, 38 years after she had first entered the harem. Suleiman takes to a sort of ascetic lifestyle. He dines off earthenware platters, and this is the man who was changing his clothes every day into a sort of cloth of gold. He becomes religious, but morbid. Eight years after Hurem's death, Suleiman joined her in the cemetery of Suleimani Mosque. 400 years later, Hurem's tomb has become a shrine for women who cherish the memory of a great Ottoman queen. Hurem really builds the foundation of this very public power that women have, although she herself was unpopular at this time. Her power was as a concubine, and that troubled people. That she was a concubine, uh, a sexually active woman in power, a problem. Hurem had devoted 38 years of her life to ensuring that one of her own sons succeeded to the throne. But ironically, instead of providing the world with another Suleiman the Magnificent, she had blazed the trail for future generations of harem women whose power would eclipse even her own. Ever since Suleiman the Magnificent fell for a slave girl called Hurem, things had been changing in the harem. European observers commented that it was like, or they thought it was like a nunnery, a monastery. But this is also um, a political crucible. The women may have been enclosed, but were no longer powerless. In this world of threat and danger, they were beginning to play an active role. Hurem had broken the mold of the anonymous, passive concubine by becoming Suleiman's confidant and wife. The women who followed would build on Hurem's power, but their power would be more as mothers than as concubines. The murderous struggle for the succession had continued after Hurem died in 1558. It was her son Selim who made it to the throne eight years later. His favorite, Nurbanu, meaning Princess of Light, 
would become the most powerful woman in the harem. She is extremely well loved and honored by His Majesty, both for her great beauty and for being unusually intelligent. She was the illegitimate daughter of two Venetian noble families, captured by an Ottoman admiral. Born Cecilia Venier Baffo, she was seized and brought to Istanbul in 1537 at the age of just 12. Nabanu was presented to Selim II when he was very young and still only a prince, and he fell madly in love with her. When he went off to the provinces to learn to govern, Selim took Nabanu with him. As a prince, he seems to have been faithful to her. Nurbanu is not just one more concubine. Nurbanu is the privileged concubine of Selim's princely career. When he becomes sultan, she comes with him to Istanbul. Like all the concubines, Nabanu was a slave, but this was not slavery as in toiling in the plantations. It was an honor and a wise career move to be a slave of the sultan. For women, it meant the chance of being in the imperial harem, which was a, a, a wonderful career for women because it was a finishing school as well as a harem. You, you learned skills, you were protected from the wear and tear of daily life, and there was a possibility of becoming the sultan's consort. Nabanu Sultan Selim was not the greatest catch. He hadn't aged too well. Selim II was a grave disappointment. He came after Suleiman the Magnificent, the greatest Ottoman Sultan ever, uh, and Selim was called Selim the Sot. Selim was like his father in one respect. He loved just one concubine and perhaps even married her. But in all their years together, they had had only one son, Murad, though they did have four daughters. The first duty of an Ottoman sultan, or I suppose any monarch at all, is to produce healthy heirs. So Selim had to get on with it pretty sharpish and produce more sons, which he did towards the end of his reign. With all the princes battling to be sultan, these new sons by other mothers would be a threat to Nabanu's son when Selim died, which he soon did. According to the stories, he came to rather an ignominious end. One can guess probably because he'd been hitting the bottle. But the story goes that uh, in the bathhouse, he stubbed his toe and slipped over, and of course Turkish baths are all stone inside, and he hit his head on the stone and died instantly. The death of the Sultan was often a crisis, because there's that period between the death of the Sultan and the arrival of the new Sultan on the throne. If the new Sultan was not in Istanbul, that period could stretch into three, four weeks. So there was a possibility of rebellion, of a prince trying to take over the throne, of all kinds of things happening. So often they would hide the fact that the Sultan had died. Nabanu took control. Nabanu hid Selim's body in the ice rooms in the palace cellars until her son, Murad, returned from the provinces to take his place. She only announced his death after her son arrived. This action by Nurbanu um, is a remarkable one, but it's also part of the role of people at the heart of power. And from the end of the 16th century on, it was so often women who were there at the very heart. So when Murad arrives from the provinces, he's obviously going to become sultan, but then we have the problem of fratricide. He's got five brothers living in the palace. Murad spent some time alone with his mother. It is said she reminded him of his duty to kill his brothers. We have the account of a Jewish physician. He said that Murad spent a lot of time very unhappy thinking about it. But in the end, custom, and perhaps indeed the uh, pressure of his mother and certainly Ottoman politics said he had no choice.
I think particularly for the mothers in the hurry, there was a terrifying sense of paranoia, a state of constant anxiety. I sometimes try to imagine myself into the place of, of one of those women. I'm sure they raised these children knowing full well that their son might be executed. The Ottomans took care of letting one son uh, be successful and making him without any contenders for the throne. If one or two of his brothers survived, then there is civil war. One or two boys versus thousands of being killed in civil war is what we are talking about. Murad made up his mind. It was a night of terror in the harem. The very first political act he takes is to have his brothers executed so that only one line would remain. The first sight that the population of the capital saw of Murad's reign was the coffins of the little princes emerging from the doors of the palace. Although there was nothing new about sultans killing their brothers, this was the first time it had happened under the nose of the people of Istanbul. One of the mothers then killed herself. She'd failed in her prime function as the mother of a prince to keep her son alive. In 1574, Annabanu was triumphant. As mother of the new sultan, she would now rule the roost in the harem. The role of queen mother was, in a sense, an invention of Nurbanu's, for Nurbanu. She's the first woman who acquired the title of Valide Sultan, queen mother, empress dowager. The Sultan bases his policies principally on the advice of his mother, it appearing to him that he could have no other advice as loving and loyal as hers. She corresponded as the mother of the Sultan with Catherine de' Medici, Queen Mother of France, and the Venetian ambassador wrote, all good and all ill come through the Queen Mother. She was absolutely top dog in the hurry. But she was still watching out for her son's career because she rose and fell with him. There was one threat to her position. Her son had a favorite, Sophia. It's a problem between the bride and the mother-in-law. Murad III loves his favorite, Sophia Sultan, very much. Nurbanu's jealousy and cruelty towards Sophia is something recorded in our history. Like so many of the sultans, Murad was going against Ottoman tradition by singling out one woman. When he became sultan, his job was then to produce a lot of sons, kind of as insurance, in case Safiya's own son should, should become ill and, and die. And he didn't. He stuck with Safiya. And this really troubled people. Nabano tried everything to make her son meet other women and go to bed with them. She found many beautiful concubines who dance well and organized nights with dancing. The gift of two concubines by his sister is, is the trick that, uh, that turns the situation around. And off he goes. So reluctant in the beginning, he had no problem. After this, Murad almost pushed Safiya aside and began going with other women. Against all tradition, 
Murad even started to sleep among the women inside the harem. Nabanu had him where she wanted him, in bed, making more princes. This symbolizes that the sultans are more restricted to the palace and in particular the harem. The tradition of the campaigning sultan campaigning every summer is dying away. Nurbanu was the one who encouraged Murad III to take up his residence in the harem, which meant that she had more power over him than previously been the case for any woman in Ottoman history. And uh, you can see her as a pivotal figure in increasing the role of the harem and of its head, the Valid Sultan, in the running of the state. It's about power returning from the periphery of the empire as it grows, returning towards the center. And now you go down to the center, it's the palace. And you go to the center of the palace, it's the harem. And who's in the harem? It's the women. In Murad's reign, the empire reached its peak, stretching from Iran in the east to Budapest in the west. Murad and his mother had the harem extended, and more and more women were brought in from all over the empire. Numbers rose from about 130 on Selim II's death to 600 on Murad III's. Historians then and since muttered darkly about decadence and decline. During Murad III's reign, the size of the harem increased greatly, but I can't see any reason why having a larger harem should cause an empire to decline. Some Ottoman observers disapproved of the development of what would be called the Sultanate of Women. The harem was close to power. Indeed, there was a window looking onto the council chamber in the imperial palace where the sultan would overhear the proceedings in the council. And it's from within the harem. So some inmates of the harem would have been very well informed. And of course, proximity to power leads to discussions about power and wanting to influence decisions which to outsiders would seem like intrigue. Only men can become sultans, but women are political actors. So in a sense, I mean, the top woman in the female hierarchy in the palace is not only a political role, but it's a top political role. The palace is the seat of political life. Faction, jockeying, information, worries, policies, and the harem was a part of that. So at the same time that we've got this, these rules um, and this strong hierarchy, we've also got a lot of conflict, worry, looking for allies, teaming up. Nabanu's harem was like a department of state within the Sultan's palace. The harem was run very much like a large corporation. All the department heads would have novices to train, and uh, the departments uh, were things like the mistress of sherbets and mistress of dressmaking, mistress of jewels, and mistress of the coffee, mistress of the laundry, and the general housekeeping. In the time that Nurbanu was queen mother, we really can talk about a kind of a firming up of the hierarchy of women in, in the harem. At the very bottom, we've got your basic servants, people who boil the water for the laundry, put the coal in the furnace, this kind of service. Then I think we need to think of it as bifurcating into a reproductive, a kind of a concubine tract, and an administrative tract. There's a management team in this harem chief officer of the harem is a woman called the harem stewardess, and she's got her own staff. She carries the keys. She's in charge of all the various service divisions within the harem. The other important harem officials were the black eunuchs, guardians of the sacred space, theoretically akin to angels who, unlike men, could pass between heaven and earth. They were the only people who had access to both parts of the palace. They could go both into the harem and into the male section of the palace. And that meant that, for example, 
a black eunuch could talk to the Queen Mother about affairs of state. The Queen Mother herself couldn't then come out into the male quarters and discuss the thing, but the black eunuch could. One English observer, in fact, commented that it's the black eunuchs who run the empire. Well, I don't think that that is strictly true, but clearly they were very important people, and because they were also the controllers of the Sultan's charitable trust, they could become extremely wealthy. The palace midwives could become wealthy too. They didn't run the empire, but were central to the harem. Midwives of the palace were very popular, and they came to be very rich and they owned big houses. They were given very precious presents after they had delivered uh, babies. They also advised on health and contraception, for unlike Christians at the time, Muslims were allowed to use contraception. The major method they talked about was what is referred to politely in the literature as coitus interruptus, which people would know as withdrawal. There was always the argument that if you practice contraception, and this was the argument used by Jewish and Christian thinkers, you're doing something against God or against nature, because you're not allowing the sexual act to reach its conclusion. The Muslim attitude was, if God really wanted a child to be born, then that child will be born. It made it possible to argue that this is not against God's wishes, which was a very nice twist on this question of whether you're going against God or not. Midwives in the harem would have prepared tampons and other barriers. These would have been coated with oils, herbs, and honey. Most of the known methods were for women, but there were some for men, too. Wuttar was uh, seen as an extremely effective contraceptive when inserted into the vagina, and then uh, it was also seen as um, an effective contraceptive if it is smeared on the penis. Wuttar obviously wasn't something Murad was using. He had a lot of children. He probably wanted to have children from all the concubines he liked. It is said in historical records that more than a hundred cradles were being rocked in the harem at the same time. He was a very busy man. Our historians say Murad had 112 children. When he died, he had 27 daughters and 20 sons alive. All the babies would be born within the harem. The tradition was to let the pregnant woman sit on a chair and give birth to her child in a sitting position. And a midwife would take it from under the chair. You knew that even as you were giving birth, your son, if it was a son, might become the next sultan. But there was a death there too. There was likely to be death. There was someone was going to come and kill that child. You had to watch out. You had to watch out all through his life. Murad was overdoing it. One son was not enough, but this was too many. It would cause a crisis when he died. People think that with a harem, an Ottoman sultan would have large number of uh, children. In fact, they, most of them had a very limited number of children. And they took great care not to have uh, too many. Sophia, mother of Murad's first son, concentrated on building up her own political position she also competed with his mother in choosing new slaves for him. Nabanu must have been furious. This was her job. For it is only she who has the interest of the loves of her son at her heart, and she can more easily assure herself of the girl's loyalty to both herself and the Sultan. There was a sort of engine revving 
to supply him with suitable concubines. And the female hierarchy of the harem was very keen on keeping control of who the sultan slept with, because that's how they kept control of the reproduction process. And that was their source of power, because they were very powerful. Within the palace, Nobanu's power was expressed in her living quarters. The Queen Mother had her own large apartments of almost 20 rooms. Because she was a strong woman with high status, the large number of rooms reflected that status. The Queen Mothers were generally very rich too, because the Sultans respected them very much and gave them very valuable presents and lands. Much of Nobanu's money went towards mosques and other vast charitable works, including military installations. This was a statement of power on an international scale. That had, up until really the time of Hurem, been the prerogative of males in the dynasty. The women who succeed Hurem as political actors are noted for their buildings. Anybody who saw the mosques that Nurbanu and her successors built would know of the importance of the Queen Mothers. This was uh, expressed in stone. Nobanu was still at the height of her powers when she died in 1583 at the age of 58. She was the first woman to be buried in the same tomb as her sultan. She had a state funeral. Against all tradition, her son, God's shadow on earth, participated. We have a wonderful miniature of the emergence of her casket from the palace, and Murad is walking in front of it. This was very unusual, a demonstration of his attachment and the importance given to her. When her son died 12 years later, his successor immediately executed his 19 brothers. The population of the capital saw 19 coffins coming out of the palace gate. And according to a contemporary chronicler, the angels in heaven wept when they saw it. The public outcry seems to have been what put an end to the practice of sultans slaughtering their brothers. But in some ways, the solution would be worse for the princes and better for the women. From the beginning of the 17th century, things changed for the sons of sultans. This would make it easier for strong women to step forward to fill the power vacuum being created. In the past, princes had been sent off to the provinces to learn to govern, and then all but one had been killed when their father died. Now they were usually kept alive, but they were confined within the harem in what was known as the kafes, or cage. Kafes, in Turkish, means the cage in which birds and chickens are kept. It's also the place where lions and tigers are locked. Mothers of Ottoman princes call their sons Aslan, lion. So when a place in the harem was built for them to be locked up, they called it kafes, because princes like lions, were locked in there. These were gilded, beautiful apartments in the harem where they could live for years, just waiting, never knowing from one day to the next what was going to happen to them, never knowing whether their brother might be deposed and they might be pulled out and made sultan themselves, never knowing whether the mutes might come in with a bowstring and finish them off.
Uh, difficulty with the cage, of course, is that it meant that the princes were withdrawn from the day-to-day -day running of the empire. So on their succession as sultan, they really knew very little about politics, which may be one reason, of course, why their mothers were so important, because their mothers would know something. The woman who used her political experience when the men most lacked it was Qasem. Qasem, in our language, means the ram that leads the sheep. In the Ottoman palace, her reign lasted about 30 years. She was like a female sultan. Qasem, possibly the daughter of a Greek priest, was the favorite of Sultan Ahmed I. She was unusual in having several sons. Once again, a sultan is adopting one woman, one concubine, in this very special way of allowing her to continue to reproduce beyond just her first son. Qasem's route to power was paved with weak sultans. She came to the fore when they were mad or underage. Her son, Murad IV, was only 12 when he took the throne. All power and authority is with the mother, in the prime of life and of lofty mind and spirit. Kersem as queen mother really is what we would call a regent. She wrote the most marvelous, candid letters to the grand viziers. She says, I must be driving you nuts with all my questions, but on the other hand, you drive me nuts too, she says. You really give me a headache but I give you an awful headache too. How many times have I asked myself, I wonder if he's getting sick of me, but what else can we do? You get a real sense of a political natural. The person who's engaged as a person and as a ruler. The Grand Vizier turned to Qasem when there were problems finding food for the army. You say attention must be paid to provisions for the campaign. If it were up to me, it would have been taken care of long ago. There is no shortcoming on either my part or my son's. Qasem really came into her own when her son Murad IV, a strong sultan, died in 1640. He left no heir and had killed all his brothers bar one, her other son, Ibrahim. Qasem had persuaded Murad not to kill Ibrahim on the grounds that he was mad. Murad dies, and people come to the door, and they say, Murad's dead, your sultan. And he doesn't believe them. He thinks there's another trick of Murad's. He fears that he's going to be executed, just like his other brothers who were executed by Murad. So he has to be persuaded that, in fact, this is not the case. And Qasem, uh, his mother, was clearly instrumental in that. of Murad and fling it down where he can see it before he agrees to come out and be made into sultan. And when he comes out, he proves to be a nutcase. Nobody expected that Ibrahim would become the sultan. He was an emotionally disturbed, uh, really handicapped individual. But he was the last Ottoman male alive. Any dynasty which lasts for as long as the Ottoman Empire is sooner or later going to get a nutter on the throne. The Ottomans over their the whole history did very well. There were very few, but the ones which happened, happened in the mid 17th century and they came together. It was the job of a queen mother to do anything she could to smooth over these political ruptures. One of the main job requirements is that when there is a dynastic crisis, you fix it, you smooth it over. 
And Qasem did a pretty good job. Qasem represented at least continuity. She'd been in power, really, for longer than anyone else. And she was very careful to keep it that way. People came in and out of office. No one was really building up the sort of contacts and the um, expertise that she was. There was nobody strong at the center of the empire. And it seems that that is why the Queen Mothers became powerful, because there had to be somebody to keep the show on the road. Given the crisis that the empire was going through during her lifetime, I think we can say it was probably thanks to Kyosem that the empire actually survived. The Ottomans had lost some of Murad III's conquests in Iran and the Caucasus, were facing rebellion in Anatolia and Istanbul, and losing battles at sea. The last thing they needed was trouble at the top. But Ibrahim was not just mad, he was impotent. He could not be cured for a while, and they were, of course, uh, terrified that he was going to die childless. That would have meant the whole country going to civil war. We have ambassadors writing home saying, get ready. I mean, this empire might simply dissolve. What's going to happen if the Ottoman Empire goes down the tubes? It's a real moment of crisis. Luckily, the Ottomans had ways of dealing with the problem. There are special books written on sexual matters, and these are called Bahname, meaning Book of Love or Book of Lust. Some of these prescriptions were kept a secret, and some of them were specially prescribed for the Sultan or the Sultan's family. Here is a very interesting uh, prescription which was said to give such a potency that a man who used it could satisfy 10 women without himself losing anything from his lust. You have to hunt for 100 large red ants and pour sesame oil on it. Leave it exposed in the sun rays for 20 days. At the end of the 20th day, pound them in a mortal till they become a uniform mass, it will be applied on the fingers, toes, and armpits. The potency during the sexual intercourse is enhanced to an incredible degree. It will give much more pleasure. It seems to have worked for Ibrahim. Eventually, Kersem taking a lead in this, Ibrahim was induced to take a concubine. And with the birth of his first son, a huge collective sigh of relief. He then goes on to become excessively, uh, how shall we say, excessively interested in sex. He had apparently, you know, all his women were, he, he rode around on them. They were naked. Uh, he ran around them like a stallion, sort of neighing. Okay, kind of kinky guy. They say he was especially interested in fat women, and once, he insisted, bring me the fattest woman in Istanbul. And they found her and brought her. He spent time with her for days, and all the time she told him fairy tales. Once she told him the sable story, and the Sultan wanted to hear it every day. It was about a sultan who really loved sable furs, soft, soft, and he caressed it and decorated everywhere with fur. The chairs were fur, the curtains were fur. In order to make the story real, he wanted everything to be covered with fur. We read about a fur tax that he imposed on the empire because he wanted to line uh, rooms in the palace with fur and mirrors. And we read about real abuse at Ibrahim's hands in which he makes his sisters come and wait on one of his concubines. I mean, this is a complete perversion of the hierarchy of dignity and service and seniority. Those must have been very difficult years for Kusem. But obviously it did not isolate her from being a political player because she still has the connections to help engineer his removal from the throne. By the end of his reign in 1648, 
uh, the empire was clearly weakening. The Venetian navy was at the entrance to the, to the Dardanelles. There was starvation in the capital, and the viziers decided that he had to be deposed. And finally, his mother, Kersem, agreed to this. Kersem wrote to the Grand Vizier. In the end, he will leave neither you nor me alive. We will lose control of the government. The whole society is in ruins. Have him removed from the throne immediately. For the sake of the empire and her own political career, she was prepared to sacrifice her own son. She had a grandson on hand to take his place. She produced his son Mehmed to the council with the words, here he is, see what you can do with him. Clearly she didn't overestimate the vizier's abilities. With his seven-year-old son on the throne, Ibrahim is in prison again. The person who rules the palace is Qasem Sultan, so she must agree to her son being imprisoned and her grandson being on the throne. But Qasem could not let this continue. Ibrahim's supporters might have tried to reinstate him. A fatwa was issued, saying there cannot be two sultans in one country. The officials went to the cage with an executioner and had Ibrahim strangled. With Ibrahim out of the way, Qasem had a new problem. The boy sultan's mother wanted her share of the action. Once again, an older woman had a young rival jostling her for power. During the reigns of her two sons, Qasem had been queen mother. Now, with her grandson on the throne, she wanted to continue in power as queen grandmother. But her grandson had a mother, a young woman called Turhan. Now, Turhan, with a faction around her, wanted to have the position of queen mother herself. We have a whole new rivalry of two queen mothers. First time in the Ottoman Empire that you've got two women at the heart of power, two women who, in a sense, are acting as regents. The two queens were exasperated highly against each other, one to maintain the authority of her son, and the other her own. The traditional thing, although we have to remember that tradition is new, it's a bit ad hoc, but it would have been for Qasem to step aside. Step aside meant leaving with your retinue the Topkapa Palace to move to another imperial palace into retirement. The Palace of Tears, it was called, where the former Sultan's women would be sent to while away the rest of their days when the new Sultan took over. One reason Qasem may have been reluctant to remove herself from the center of politics is that the new Sultan's mother is really quite young. She may simply have felt that it wasn't the wise thing to do. But we have to remember also that she probably simply did not want to give up this intensely exciting political life that she had enjoyed for so many years. So Qasem stuck around, and a deadly tug of love began with both women trying to influence the young sultan. These regent queen mothers, Qasem, and then Turhan, as political actors, needed to communicate. And the whole question is, how could they do it? Because they were in the harem. The chronicles tell us that they spoke behind screens. Do we envision a kind of a lattice screen they were obviously there, quite close, simply not visible. Sometimes they spoke directly. Sometimes we hear that they whispered answers through the screen. We even hear about an incident in which young Mehmet turns to the screen and says, what answer do I give? And the answer is then conveyed to him. Qasem defended her influence on her grandson. You said this to the Sultan. My dear, who taught you to say these things? Such patronizing behavior towards sultans is impermissible. 
And what if the Sultan is instructed? The official she was berating drowned, it is said, in the sea of mortification. But Turhan was not so easily defeated. On the night of September the 2nd, 1651, things came to a head. Qasem Sultan wants to take her grandson from the throne and put another prince there, whose mother is more malleable. That prince is also six or eight years old. The young mother thought that in order to save her son, she should really eliminate Qasem. So that night, she told her own people to find her and strangle her. But that was the only way you could get rid of Qasem. She wasn't going to retire voluntarily. reminiscent of a couple of centuries earlier when the tension and the rivalry is among princes and brothers. Now this kind of rivalry has displaced itself into the palace itself and is among powerful women. It is said that when a eunuch spoke up for Qasem, they split his head with an ax. His blood and brains were dashed on the rich carpets right in front of the boy Sultan. He then signed his grandmother's death warrant, saying she should be strangled, but neither cut with sword nor bruised with blows. Some of the slaves hunted for Kursem. She hid in a cupboard, and it's said that her presence was betrayed by the hem of her dress sticking out from behind the door. <laughs> Seeing two great jewels at her ears, they immediately tore them thence. They were two diamonds of the bigness of chestnuts, and beneath each diamond was a ruby. Those earrings were given her by Sultan Ahmed, and esteemed by the most skillful jewelers worth a year's revenue of Grand Cairo. She's a controversial person. She was a great manipulator, and uh, she meddled in uh, politics. She was a dragon. She did everything in her power for political power, and she acquired great wealth. She was never satisfied. Kersim has a mixed press. As with her predecessors, Norbano, Safiye, uh, Kersim was highly praised by many people, simply for her role as an important uh, figure in the dynasty. I think by the time of Kersem, we can say that, that she was revered as Queen Mother. Kersem's young rival, Turhan, continued as regent for five years, but then her son and his advisors took command. As the centuries have passed, the women have continued to be criticized for meddling in politics and bringing down the empire. Recently, their role has been reconsidered. Traditionally, historians have liked to say that this was the beginning of the decline of the Ottoman Empire. We do have to remember that the Ottoman Empire lasted until, well, 1918, and the last vestige disappeared in, in 1923. So we must be careful about talking about decline, and I don't think women had anything to do with it. The women of the harem had to step in to protect their sultan and to guide him in the running of the empire. Now, they were doing that at a period when there were lots of problems. And what's happened is that those women who were doing the best for the empire as they saw it are getting blamed for the problems, which are the things they were actually having to face up to and to solve. While it's okay for men to be ruthless, that's not seen as a very good thing for a woman. When people look back on this period, this period really of 100 years um, from Hurem through Turhan, they look with a, a kind of a mixed attitude. It was a real change in the way the dynasty was managed. At the end of the Sultanate of Women, we don't see women with that degree of public political power. Had it continued, I think, it would have become a very natural phenomenon. 
It's hard to say whether the self-native women was a good thing or a bad thing. They did what they could. They struggled to survive. They did what they had to. And uh, some amazing women emerged. But many, many, many didn't and were submerged. And history doesn't talk about them. The imperial harem was to continue for another two and a half centuries. Hundreds of women would disappear into it, but none was to come forward to play such a commanding role as Harem, Nobanu, or Qasem.